when it comes to all things in, in our life, but particularly to our worship. Uh, and this is an, an exceptional worship, us worshiping online. And I want to make that very clear. We're not going to complete this tonight because I do not want to rush through it. But what I'm trying to do is lay the foundation and the groundwork for us to understand that one, we are not in sin that we cannot gather together to worship. But I want to make it perfectly clear that this was not God's divine plan for his church. And then secondly, I want to show you that this is not the first time that God people had to be scattered abroad, but yet they found a way to worship uh, God in spirit and in truth. And so we'll get to that. But I, I want to just talk about, lay the foundation here, uh, the importance of worship, and give you a historical backdrop of what God has always intended. When his people were to come together, uh, when his people were to worship, God always wanted them to come together. Now, uh, two weeks ago, uh, I want to thank those of you who did attend uh, my home church 61st um, anniversary celebration. I know some of you had problems getting on and others had some other things they had to do, but I want to thank those of you who did attend. Uh, but two weeks ago, uh, I left off talking about uh, talking about uh, this phrase that we hear people say all the time, well, I'm the church. The church is not the building. Uh, you know, the church is not the brick and mortar or the four walls, and that's very true. But I just want to solidify uh, real quickly, three verses, uh, that while we are part of the church, we are never referred to as the church being one person. The church is not one member. We are a member of the church, but we are not the church. And I just want to reiterate that, and then we'll move a little further. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 12 through 14, and I'm going to read from the King James Version. Again, that's 1 Corinthians 12, uh, verse 12 through 14. The Bible says, for as the body is one, the complete body of Christ, the church is one body. But watch what Paul says. He says, and have many members, and all the members of that one body being many, are one body so also is christ so he always he's already making his claim clear that yes the church is one body that has many members but the many members together make up the church verse 13 for by one spirit that's the spirit of god the holy spirit of god are we all baptized into one body you see that that terminology there again all all baptized into one body whether we be jews or gentiles whether we be bond or free and have been all made to drink into one spirit now he's speaking in metaphors there being made to drink into one spirit uh, that means to just receive one spirit that's all that simply means all right look at verse 14 here's here's where i want to lay my hat and we'll move on for the body is not one member. Now that's just as plain, my daddy would say, Brother Johnson, that's just as plain as the nose on your face. He says, for the body is not one member, but many. So we can't get beside ourselves and try to be a smart aleck and, you know, to try to come up with a reason why we can't, we don't have to come to worship or why we don't have to assemble, or why we don't have to congregate, because I'm gonna show you historically, and it has never changed, that God has always, when it came to worship, God has always intended for his people to come together, to congregate, and to meet him at a particular place, at a particular time, for the purpose of worship, all right? Uh, and I'm gonna show you that. I'm gonna show you a call tonight. Let's go to Genesis chapter 22. Uh, I'm not going to ask those of you who did your homework, uh, the reading assignment I gave you, but Genesis chapter 22, verse 1 through 19. Genesis chapter 22, verse 1 through 19. And I want to show you something historically in this text. 
Oh man, Brother Johnson, it's a lot of pre. You can do a series pop just in this this text alone, just in chapter. And, and Marcus, I know, I know you see it. I know you already see it. There's a lot of teaching and preaching uh, in this text, but I'm gonna try not to hold you too long on it. But let's look at it real quickly. And I want to read this text and then come back and explain it a little bit. And I'm gonna read from the NLT tonight, the new uh, the living the New Living Translation, the NLT. The Bible says in Genesis 22, 1 through 19, sometime later, oh, it's a lot of preaching right there. Sometime later. Mama, we already see in the text that Abraham and God already had a thing going on. Wave your hand if you can. Marcus, they already had a relationship. There was already a kinship. There was already a covenant being worked out, Brother Spence. There was some already going on in the life of God and Abraham together. He says sometime later, God tested Abraham's faith. Again, I'm reading from NLT. Abraham, watch this, watch this. Abraham, God called. Watch this, God called, but then listen to this. Yes, he replied, here I am. So we see there's a call and we see there's a response and it's personal. He says, take your son, listen to the wordage, your only son, yes, Isaac, whom you love so much, and go to the land of Moriah. Go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will show you. Huh. The next morning, watch this, Abraham got up early. He saddled his donkey and took two of his servants with him along with his son Isaac. He didn't intend on being late getting to worship. The Bible said he got up early. I'm just going to let that set in on you. Then the Bible said, then he chopped wood for a fire, for a burnt offering, underline that term, burnt offering, and set out for the place God told him about. Abraham had to move. Watch this. On the third day of their journey, good God almighty, some of us can't even travel 30 minutes for church. Hello, somebody. But the Bible says, on the third day of their journey, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Stay here with the donkey, Abraham told the servants. The boy and I will travel a little further. We will, watch this, worship there, and then we will come back. So Abraham placed the wood for the burnt offering on Isaac's shoulder while he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them walked on together, Isaac turned to Abraham and said, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. We have the fire and the wood, the boy said. But where is the sheep for the burnt offering? God will provide a sheep for the burnt offering, my son, Abraham answered. And they both walked together. Oh, that's some preaching right there. They both walked together. When they arrived at the place where God had told him to go, Abraham built an altar and arranged the wood on, the, on it. Then he tied his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on the top of the wood. And Abraham picked up the knife to kill his son as a sacrifice. At that moment, the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Yes, Abraham replied, here I am. Don't lay a hand on the boy, the angel said. Do not hurt him in any way, for now I know that you truly fear God. You have not withheld from me even your son, your only son. Then Abraham took up the saw. Abraham looked up, I'm sorry, and saw a ram caught by its horns in the thicket. So he took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering in place of his son. Abraham named the place Yahweh Yare, which means the Lord will provide. To this day, people still use that name as a proverb on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Then the angel of the Lord called again to Abraham from heaven. This is what the Lord said, because you have obeyed me and have not withheld your son, your only son, I swear by my own name, that I will certainly bless you. I will multiply your descendants beyond numbers. 
like the stars in the sky and the sand on, in, on the seashore. Your descendants will conquer the cities of their enemies. And through your descendants, all the nations of the earth will be blessed, all because you have obeyed me. Then they returned to the servants. Then they returned to the servants and traveled back to Beersheba, where Abraham continued to live. Historically, man has always been called together to, to a place at a specific time to worship God. So let me say that again. Historically, man has always been called to a particular place at a particular time to worship God. Historically, the people, the believers of God, gathered together to come into the presence of God. They gathered to come into the presence of God and they also gathered to invite God into their presence for the purpose of worship. Remember, our key theme here is worship. I wanna show you tonight that before the New Testament Church of Christ was ever established, that it was a practice, a relationship with God and his believers or followers to congregate, to come together and to worship. That was a standard practice of God with his believers. In Genesis 22, 1 through 19, we see the story of Abraham offering up Isaac, his dear beloved son, the Bible says. He was offering Isaac, watch this now, he was offering Isaac to God as a burnt offering. Remember, this was the son that he loved, that he prayed for. He offered him to God as a burnt offering. I told you earlier to underline the term burnt offering. The term burnt offering represents an act of worship. It was, it was the greatest act in the biblical day of Abraham. It was the greatest act of worship that anyone could perform to show their devotion, their commitment, and their trust in God. It was so important, and, and you would have to go back all the way to Leviticus uh, it, it even uh, to see the, the real importance of how specific God was about his offerings because it was such a devotional, committed act of sacrifice, an act of worship to God. I believe that a good Bible student can see the golden gem in this text tonight in that this story of Abraham, the future father of faith, uh, he was offering up his beloved son in the Old Testament. And this is a shadow. I got a question tonight. What is this a shadow of in the New Testament? This offering of Abraham, uh, of Abraham offering his son Isaac. What is that a shadow of? Now remember what a shadow is. The shadow is not the object, but it is, it is an image of the object. So what, what is this a shadow of? This is a question to the class tonight. What is this a shadow of in the New Testament? The Lamb of God. That's right. I, start, I meant to say no Bible teachers can answer tonight. <laughs> oh. <laughs> no, you're right, Doc. You're right. Brothers and sisters, this is a shadow uh, or a preface of God offering his dear son, the Lamb of God, Christ, for the sins of the world. You're absolutely right, Brother Marcus. That's what this is a shadow of. But it's more than that. Watch this. In this story, there is an account of, watch this. There is an account of a Gethsemane, an account of Calvary, and there's a picture of the resurrection. Are you with me, Brother Elliot? Are you with me? Yes. There, there, is, there is an account. We see a picture of Gethsemane. We see a picture, Brother Johnson, of Calvary. And Sister Iris, we see a picture of a resurrection. All right? We see Gethsemane in verses 1 through 4. All right? In verses 1 through 4. Uh, which is 
we know it as the garden of sorrow for Christ in the New Testament. All right, are you with me, Brother Hollis? All right, and we see Calvary in verses five through 12. All right, five through 12, where Abraham literally had to offer his son and put him on the, on the wood, all right? And of course, that's in parallel to Jesus being on the cross. But then we also see the resurrection, and we'll go through this a little later, verses 13 through 14. Uh, where Isaac, obviously, in the inference of the text, Isaac was risen up from the altar and replaced with a ram, all right? And so, of course, we see Jesus uh, rising from the grave. But notice now the details of this account. Let's look at these details very quickly. Boy, my time is running tonight. In verse 1, God called Abraham, and he responded. Now, remember, this is a portrait of worship. So worship is a call from God. Let me say that again if you're taking notes. Worship is a call from God. But it's not only just a call from God, but it's a call with an expectation of response. All right? In verse 2, God told Abraham where to go, and he told him what to do. Oh, I got to park my mule here for a minute. God never, Brother Marcus, Brother Teacher, God never leaves worship up to us to figure out. I wish I had just somebody wave their hand. Am I close to being right? God never leaves worship up to man to figure it out. Because what we must remember, there's only one person in audience in worship, in the audience, and that's God. Everyone else are performers. There is a byproduct of worship where the believers become edified and encouraged, all right? And we edify one another. But the purpose of worship is to glorify God and to satisfy God. How do we know that? The Bible said without faith, it's impossible to please God. That's what we're trying to do by faith, all right? So verse two, God told Abraham where to go and he told Abraham what to do. All right. Uh, he told him to offer his son as a burnt offering. That was the act of worship in that day and at this particular time. Let's remember that in the church of Christ, we don't practice things in worship just because it sounds good, feel good or look good or something we like to do. And we don't we don't practice things and say, well, God didn't say not to do it. Well, God didn't tell Abraham not to offer two of those servants he was bringing with him, did he? Wave your hand when you can. He had two extra servants there. Why didn't Abraham say, well, God didn't tell me don't offer them for a sacrifice. God has given us a good brain and he's given us direction. God does not have to tell you what not to do when he has told you what to do. Look at verse three. In verse three, Abraham, remember we're talking about worship, Abraham did what God said. Abraham got up and he went where God told him and when God told him and he was prepared to do what God said. Let me say that again. He got up when God told him. He went where God told him. He did what God said. All right, was preparing to do what God said. In verse four, we know there was a going, watch this. We know that there was a going between verses three and four. But watch this. It took three days. They were going to worship, Sister Iris. But it took three days. Now, the reason why I'm letting that settle in tonight, and God knows the people who need to hear it, they, they not on here tonight, so y'all need to take good notes so y'all can share it with them. It's a sad commentary, Sister Johnson, that Abraham was prepared to go into worship and re responded to God and, and had to travel three days for worship. But look what God has done. He has given us the ability now to roll over and turn on an iPhone, an iPad, or a computer and push a button for worship, and we can't even roll over and do that. Lord, have mercy. Let me move on. I don't want to get stuck there. All right. Here is where I want to park my meal tonight. Look at verse number five. 
In verse number five, Abraham said, we've done all of this. All right. Abraham said, we've done all of this in order to go and worship. He said, we were going to worship. The word worship, for those who want to take notes, strong reference number 7812, 7812. It's the strong reference number there. The word there is shall call. Let me hear you say shall call. Shall call. S H A C H A H. Let me say it again. S H A C H A A. A H, I'm sorry. S H A. C-H-A-H. Let me give you phonetic spelling of it so you know how to pronounce it. S-H-A-W dash K-H-A-W hyphen. One more time. S-H-A-W dash K-H-A-W hyphen. Shaw call. And the word worship here in the generic term or form means to bow down. It means to bow down. But it also literally means to pay homage. To pay homage. And in biblical times, many times when they worship God, they would not only bow down, but they would prostrate. They would lay out and stretch out on their face before God. But the key idea here we want to carry tonight with this text is to pay homage. That's what worship is. It is a bowing to God. The word bow means to surrender or show humility. All right? Uh, to show a posture of surrendering to a higher power or authority. All right? And in layman terms, it was an act for the believer of God to honor him. This is what Abraham was doing. It was an act of the believer of God to honor him. That's what worship does. Worship honors God. That's why we just can't do it any way we want to do it. Because it's not about us, it's about honoring God. I got to move on. I got a question tonight. Uh, and anybody other than the teachers can answer tonight. Um, couldn't couldn't have all of this, could have all of this been done, Sierra, uh, uh, Iris, uh, Sister Kim, Sister John Johnson, uh, Brother Elliot, Brother Smith, could, couldn't all of this have been done right there in Abraham's own tent? Don't all speak at one time. Couldn't, couldn't Abraham had built an altar prepared the wood. He had the knife already at home. I'm sure it was easier to, to just pick up, go over there and get the wood and, and set it up instead of carrying it for a three days journey. He could um, That's not what he, God told him to do. I was just going to say that. What did you say? He could have, but that's not what God told him to do. Oh, you have spoke the golden text tonight, mama. That's exactly right. That's it's out of order. Right. Somebody else said something? It's out of order. What did you say? <laughs> like, sister, piggybacking off of what Sister Jay said, that's not what God told him to do. And if he would have done something out of order, then it wouldn't have been the right sacrifice. Oh, you said it. You said the right thing, girl. You said it. That's exactly right. It was not what God said. And anything other than what God says is out of order. All right? Because our goal is to be in order, Brother Johnson, one of his term, lock and step with God. That's, that's what our goal is. It's not to please ourselves, but to be lock and step with God. All right? Look at the historical backdrop. I want to show you something here as my time is clicking away. Watch this. Watch this historical backdrop. Notice there is not one note about Abraham having an emotional breakdown with God. Notice in the text, Brother Marcus, there is no argument of Abraham with God. But notice what he was asking him to do. 
This was God asking for Abraham's beloved son. And, and listen, Cyrus, I think, I think out of everybody on this call, tonight, I know how much you love your son, your one and only son. All right. Abraham, it took a hundred years for Abraham to get this boy. And this was the love of his life. He prayed for Isaac. He desired Isaac. He was a miracle child. But now he's asking him to sacrifice him. But notice, I cannot move from this without noticing, Abraham didn't argue one bit. He didn't question God. And I'm going to culminate on that in just a moment, but I want that to settle in for you. Abraham had heard, watch this now, Brother Johnson, this is what I believe, and, and, and I think my research back it up. Abraham, this was not the first time he heard the voice of God. And we know through scripture that there's many things that has been done that has not been recorded in scripture. That's what the Bible says. But we know, Sister Johnson, this was not the first time Abraham dealt with God. This was not the first time he heard the voice of God and, 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 and he had heard this voice many times before this very test of his faith, all right? How many of you know, let's step out of the text for a minute, the context of the Bible and step into the context of our lives. How many of us have loved ones, maybe our parents or our spouses or siblings or relatives that we are very close to, they're like our homies, I mean, we're like birds in the feather, uh, you know, stick together. Uh, we're homies, road dogs. We, we know each other. We trust each other. We have a covenant relationship. And one of us say something or acts a request of the other one, and we ain't quite understanding, but, but you know, Brother Johnson asked me to do this, so I, I know this must be something I need to do. Anybody? Great. Can, can anybody attest to that? You know? Brother Johnson, you and Sister Johnson, I know y'all should be raising y'all hand. I know, or maybe y'all know each other too well to be in that predicament. <laughs> but there's been times where you're requested to do something and because of your relationship, you may not quite understand why, but you do it. Well, watch this. Abraham trusted God. Worship. You cannot have true worship without true trust. You got to trust God, okay? He proved to God that he believed and he trusted the gift. Watch this. He trusted the giver greater than his love for the gift. Let me say that again. He trusted the giver of the gift greater than his love for the gift. I think sometime in worship, we get so caught up, oh Lord have mercy, Jesus. We get so caught up with our gifts that we praise the gift more than we praise the giver. I was in a conversation with a young lady the other day. I was just coming out of the church building, just got in my car and in my fact, she called just to check on me and, and, and well, Ramona actually asked me how was Ramona's grandmother and all that. But this young lady, she's a sweet young lady. I met her some years ago, actually here in Grenada, Mississippi. But she calls herself a prophetess. <laughs> she says, Johnson, I saw your head. She calls herself a prophetess, Brother Johnson. She believes that she has the power to preach and, and to lead God's people. So y'all know what I did. I didn't get off the church parking lot for probably another 40 minutes. I started a Bible class right then, all right? And, and one thing she said, and this is what stuck out with me, Marcus, she said, y'all, y'all Baptist. I said, wait a minute now. I done told you several times I'm not Baptist. Well, what, what y'all Christian for whatever you, I said, yes, Christian. Y'all men, y'all just kill me. Y'all think y'all the only ones can speak for God and blah. I said, wait a minute. She said, no, I don't believe God will give us these kind of gifts and we just got to sit down and shut up. I said, first of all, honey, it's not about your gifts. 
So, you know, of course, I gave all kinds of examples of different gifts I have, but I don't have the authority to exercise those gifts. All right. So here's the thing. We fall sometimes in love with the gift and not the giver. Can I go just a little deeper tonight? If I can go a little deeper, just say, go on deep, Brother Miles. Please. Watch this. Watch this. You all have heard me say many times that God does everything with purpose. You have heard it said before that we must trust God even when we cannot trace God. Notice God never told Abraham why he, uh, Abraham why he need to meet him after a three-day journey to worship him in the Mount of Moriah. We don't find that anywhere in the scripture why God told Abraham he needs to go to Moriah for this worship. But notice, write this down in your notes. First Chronicles 21, 18. Watch this. Mount Moriah is the very place where in latter years, King David bought the threshing floor of Ornan as a place for the site of the temple to be built. The very place where Abraham offered Isaac, years later, was purchased by King David for the building of the temple. It was on the very place, that very place where Abraham traveled three days to worship, that God, uh, to worship God, the temple of Solomon was built there. Second Chronicles chapter three, verse one. Here's my point. You never know what great work will take place where God calls his people to worship and to congregate. You all heard me say this before. There is a reason God called Brother Larry Johnson, E. Johnson, to Bloomington, Illinois, to plant a congregation. Because there is something down the road. It may not even come in my tenure. But there is a reason why God has called his people to uh, 406 South Clinton in Bloomington, Illinois. There is a reason. We may not see it now. But there is a divine reason. Notice, it's at this particular worship of Abraham and Isaac. There was, and I'm going to stop here because my time is up. Notice at this particular uh, worship, at this particular worship of Abraham and Isaac, there was at least seven things present. Number one, there was a call. Whenever worship takes place, God is calling his people. Number two, there was an answer. There was an answer. When we show up for worship, we are answering God's call. Watch this. Number three and four is compound. Number three, there was a preparation. We know that. We see it in the text. Abraham had to gather his wood. He had to make sure he had the knife. He had to get things together, prepare to go to worship. We should not be showing up at worship just haphazardly. And I know Brother Johnson and the other Brother Johnson and, 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 and Brother Spence and Brother Elliot, they're all teachers. I know, and Sister Johnson, I know it's nothing more frustrating when you have studied hard, burnt midnight oil, did research, put a nice lesson together from God, and then you look out in the artists and people just broke down. No Bible, no paper, not taking notes, all right? There was a preparation for worship. Number four, there was a commitment. We know Abraham was committed because he made that journey. So number three and number four, appreciation, commitment, says something to me, Brother Johnson. It, that produced an obedience, an obedience, all right? But then number five, there was a sacrifice. Every time we come to worship, we should be preparing to give God something. We should, you know, folk, and especially black folk, because I can talk about us because that's all I know. Most of us, Sister Johnson, we come to worship looking for something. And if the song leader, Sierra, don't sing our song or don't sing it right, 
Oh, I just, you know, I just, that singing wasn't good today. You know, well, but Marcus did a good job. It just don't seem like he had all the luster today. He just, like he didn't have enough luster in his teaching today. I don't know. What did you bring to worship? What did you bring? All right. There was a sacrifice. All right. Number six, there was salvation at worship. Salvation was at worship. God spared Isaac. Why? Because of an obedience. Because of the obedience of his father. All right. And then seven, there was faith. Above all, if you don't have faith, Romans 6 and 4, it's what? It's impossible to please God. All right? So if you don't have faith, you ain't going to worship. You're not going to hear a call. You're not going to answer the call. You're not going to you're not going to prepare. You're not going to have a commitment. You sure ain't going to get no sacrifice. I wish I had some help here. <laughs> you sure ain't going to get no sacrifice. Uh, you won't receive salvation. And you won't have faith. All right. Um, here's how important faith is. And I'm going to close right here. Brother Johnson, I'll give it to you. And we'll come back next week, guys, with Exodus chapter 24. Write that down. Exodus chapter 24, verse 1 through 11. We'll start there next week. Exodus chapter 24, 1 through 11. Real quick. Watch this. The Bible said in Romans 14, 23, here's something to go home on. This is, this is one to grow on. Romans 14, 23. Whatever. Watch this. Whatever is not of faith is sin. Let me say that again. Whatever is not of faith is sin. The reason we don't just do any and everything we want to in worship in the church of Christ is because it must be by faith. All right, what is faith? Romans 10, 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the what? Word of God, all right? Faith, pistis, a, a being convinced of a belief or practice especially in the Christian church, the gospel of Jesus Christ. All right? All right? You receive the word tonight. I Brother trust the play that has challenged you. Remember those seven things. I might ask you to recite it to me next week. All right? But Brother that's Miles, what when you show up. Yes, sir. Go ahead. I won't. The spirit won't let me sleep if I don't say if I don't say this. This, on, this I nugget. Go, there's some. It's some. It's some in here. There's some in here that 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 every day you got to think about. Come on. In chapter 22, the very first verse in the New King James version. Okay. Says, and it came to pass these things that God did tempt Abraham. Yes. Right. Why did he use that word tempt? Uh -huh. and to that, try that, to prove uh -huh. for try to try for proof. So that, we're talking about worship here, right? That's right. And we're talking about obedience and sacrifice and all of that, which is involved in our worship. That's right. So is it possible that every time we have an opportunity to worship, we're being tried and that's God right. wants us to prove that's right something. And I can, I'm going to bless you beyond compare. Yes, but sir. This is the test to see whether you're going to worship me on a daily basis when you feel good, when you don't feel good, when you got money in your pocket, when you don't got money in your pocket, when you your, your health is declining, when people are acting funny at church, uh, when there is a quarantine and nobody is watching you. Uh -huh. Are you going to worship? Because God is tempting you yeah so this sunday next wednesday god is tempting you uh -huh. he's testing you that's right that's right and that's the better translation uh testing that because that's what he does mm. that's what he does any other comments any other questions all right brother jay is on you well marcus is closed out so uh <laughs>
I don't uh, I don't have a lot to say. The one thing that I want to do want to emphasize is uh, the idea of uh, kind of what was brought up earlier is that God is a God of specificity. Yes, sir. He never leaves anything up to us in terms of our worship or anything else that he commands. And when you look at worship, particularly our corporate worship, think about this. When, when you look at our corporate worship, he doesn't leave it up to us uh, how we sing or what we sing. He says the psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Mm -hmm. that, that leaves out uh, hip-hop, Rowena. It, <laughs> it leaves out blues, Sister J. It, it tells us exactly what, you know, he tells us about uh, what we should take for the communion. That's you right. know, he tells us, he didn't say collard greens and Mountain Dew. He said unleavened bread and fruit of the vine. You know, he tells us what to preach, Brother Miles. <laughs> the oracles of God, preach truth, you know. Uh, and so you could go on and on. Jesus teaches us how to pray. So God is a God of specificity. And when it comes to our worship, God doesn't leave it up to our imagination. That's why the world is so confused. God says that he's not, uh, uh, the Bible says that uh, God is not the author of confusion. That's and so right. the world is so confused because they want to put their own thoughts, their own uh, uh, ideas versus following God's plan. And so if we follow Abraham's example, Abraham did what God said, when he said it, and how he said it. And That's where? what we have to do. And if anybody else thinks any other thing, then they're confused because God is not confused. We just have to, you know, you, you talked about uh, uh, um, obedience in those seven things uh, that, that we ought to see in worship. And, and we just got to obey God, regardless of how we feel, how we think, what somebody else said, what Big Mama said, we just got to obey God. That's right. So as a church, individually, we make up a collective group. And think about this, of all of us obey God and worship God the way he said, what a wonderful body it would be. It's like our arms and our legs. If, if our arms and legs and eyes and ears were, were, were as uh, to use, uh, I think it was Adriana that said, out of order, then look how dysfunctional the body would be. The arm said, I'm gonna go this way, and the head said, I'm gonna go this way, and the legs said, I'm gonna go a different way. But if all of us follow the head, which represents Christ, if all of us follow the head, we're going to be in sync. Uh, that's what I have uh, tonight. Uh, and uh, I do want to, uh, to uh, uh, I got an uh, email from Sierra as a prayer request. And I would encourage uh, the rest of you, if you have